Hi and welcome. This is our individualized <coughs> support framework training. Um, so we are from Community Action Partnership of Lancaster County, Thrive to Five. Um, so go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bowes. I am a social emotional learning coach. Microphone. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bowes, social emotional learning coach. And I am Jen Martin. I'm the curriculum supervisor. Um, and I'm Betsy Swartz. I'm a curriculum coach. We are Thrive to Five. Many of us, um, many people aren't as familiar as they were with our last program name, which was Lancaster County Head Start. Uh, we took on new leadership five or six years ago. At that same time, we added programming. So we were basically serving um, HISAP classrooms and uh, Head Start three to five year olds. We have added zero to three to our programming, and we have rebranded to Thrive to Five for that reason. All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about um, our instructional support framework that we came up with as a program um, to ensure that all of our staff have equal and equitable access to our program supports and our professional development opportunities. Um, so one of the things that Jen was talking about was the intentional shift in our leadership and our relationship building and our program. And um, so we decided as a coaching team to work together um, in tandem with our classroom supervisors to create this framework because at the core of it, um, we're the closest to the classrooms and the teachers in our community. So we wanted to make sure our supervisors had a seat at the table to develop the framework. So we chose a diamond shape for our visual. Um, we modeled this after our NCPMI pyramid practices and our tiered levels of supports that we use to support children in our classrooms. Um, so we really wanted it to be something that was familiar to our classroom teams and our teachers and our program. And each level of the diamond is unique to our staff area of needs. So in the middle, you'll see that universal um, supports, which is the foundations of quality and compliance supports that, um, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> she was asking me to do something. Um, sorry. Um, so at that universal level, we're talking about those quality improvement and compliance supports that are in place for all of our team members. Um, they're not a choice. They're uh, those foundational practices that we require all of our classrooms to implement um, to help them be successful. And then you'll see the top area is designed into almost like a mini pyramid and then the bottom is also a different mini pyramid. Um, so that top piece is those quality improvement supports and that bottom piece is the compliance supports because we know sometimes compliance is um, a piece of our program that we have to implement. Um, so as I said before, we recognize that there's different areas of needs in our classrooms and um, our teachers are coming at all different levels of experience and professional development levels. So we created the diamond to talk about how there would be different areas that our teachers would always have the opportunity to grow. So we really wanted to create a visual that was fluid, that they weren't stuck in one specific area of a visual or um, a pyramid level or a tier. So um, we talked about how the majority of our teachers throughout the year usually typically stay in that universal level. Um, they're implementing their, our program-wide universal practices. They're getting walkthrough visits from their supervisors. Our coaches are on the ground going in classrooms to support. And then sometimes, depending upon situations that might be going on in the classroom, um, they might move into more quality supports and move into that targeted or tertiary level for compliance or quality. All right, so like Betsy said, there's several different tiers. The universal supports, they're the foundation for our quality improvement and for our compliance. Um, and this is required for everyone to be successful and for us to be able to help support everybody in their practices. So the universal level, like Betsy said, this is where most of our team members are gonna stay for most of the year. Um, 
the teaching team includes the early learning supervisor, who is the teacher's supervisor, the coaches, the teachers, the teaching assistants, the floating assistants, um, the family liaisons. We look at everybody as part of the classroom team because everybody has their own piece that they play that they bring to the table. Um, and at this universal level, the coaches were really the consultants because we looked at our universal practices, what needs to be in place, and who is best able to support that. So because that universal level is across the board, no matter the program, no matter the age, the supervisors should really be the first one to step in and be able to support that because they need to be aware of those foundational practices that have to be in place for the classrooms to be successful. Um, so we have several structures that are in place. We don't use the big five, the PTYRC. Okay. <laughs> and our classroom visuals that have to be in place, again, to help promote that teaching regulations, the self-regulation skills, the problem solving, the friendship building. Um, so we look at several different things for this. We do use the creative curriculum. So we utilize the foundations book to ensure that the classrooms are designed in a way for all to be successful. Um, we make sure classroom transitions are planned throughout the day, that teachers are intentional with what they're doing and that every opportunity is an opportunity for the children to grow and learn. So they should be able to answer our four essential questions, which are what am I supposed to be doing? How do I know I'm making progress? How do I know when I'm done? And what do I do next? That's where the children can help make their way through their day um, when they know what's to be expected. Um, and again, yep, we use the foundation book. As Betsy said, they do get visits, both from their supervisor and the coaches, and then we have debriefing. Um, and these conversations are very collaborative. They come from the whole team. What did I see? Here's the, what I saw when I walked in your room. Here are some grows, and here are some glows. That way, there's always something that they're doing great, and there's always something that they can work on. And that's something we talk about then as a team. Okay, this is my grow. What do I need to do next to help meet that grow? We do it in emails, we talk about action steps, we offer resources to help them get there, and we're also working on that capacity building, that staff know what to do, they know how to do it, they know where to go if they need that extra help or support. And we also want staff to know that coaching is a part of their PD. Coaching is something that they should want, it's something that they can do. I'm already doing this, I want to be able to do it up here. So they can reach out to their coach. So it's always teacher driven, it's by choice, we use our CQI data to help us determine what we're going to offer practice-based coaching on based off of program data and program needs. Um, and yeah, the coaches were in the classroom to model, to support. We're right down there in there with the team. So some of the supports that we use are the NCPMI, the National Center for Pyramid Modeling and Innovation. So again, resources that we can use directly in the classroom to help support our PBIS practices and other visuals. We use eClick, the Early Childhood Learning and Knowledge Center. Again, those are our resources that are provided through Head Start, um, trainings, other information for the teachers. And then, like I said, we use Creative Curriculum and Teaching Strategies Gold as our assessment tool. So the next area um, of the peer and we're going to talk about and the diamond is that top area. So these are the quality improvement supports. So this is when all those universal practices are in place and those teachers want to take a practice from good to better to best. And again, it's very teacher driven. Um, so in those debriefing meetings, you're talking about um, an area that you might want to grow in, um, something you might be curious about, something that you're more interested in getting more professional development on. So we recognize that um, the diamond is, is a lot to kind of break down and there's different areas of it. So we decided that we wanted a little bit more of an explanation about like what's being observed, what are the action steps at each step of the way um, for both quality and compliance improvement supports. Um, so when it comes to quality improvement supports, um, we recognize that regardless of um, any area of need in the classroom, health and safety is our number one concern. Um, so you'll see that red bar at the top that talks about how if any kind of health and safety incident were to happen in the classroom, that's immediately drawn to our supervisor's attention. So um, whether that is any kind of um, 
slip of an outlet cover to um, something more serious, it's going to be addressed immediately. Um, so that's just there as kind of a disclaimer for all of our staff to understand that this is everybody's responsibility in our program from a director to our vice president to um, a teaching member of the team. So that piece is there. Um, and then again, like Jen was saying, at the universal level, um, our classrooms are getting those visits by their coaches, their supervisors are in and out. Um, a lot of times our um, directors and our vice president are in and out of classrooms as well. Um, so there's a lot of people putting eyes on the classroom and um, hopefully their universal practices are in place and um, consistently in place. So at this point, um, the teacher might be interested in something more specific to grow in. Um, that might be asking more open-ended questions during a read aloud. Um, it could be learning more about how to incorporate emotions during choice time. Um, so they're going to reach out. Um, it might be something that they have found from their debrief debriefings. It might be something that um, a glow or grow came from a coach um, when they were in a classroom. So um, at that point, the teacher is going to reach out, going to ask them questions, and set up a time to talk more about how um, we can best support them. So that's when the coach kind of get, gets pulled in and um, begins to create that relationship and the next steps with the teachers. Um, and then at the tertiary level, um, this is where practice-based coaching comes into play. So again, as Jen was talking about before, it's always a choice to do practice-based coaching. Um, we do uh, class observations in our program as well as teapots and tippy toes. Um, so oftentimes that could be directed from that. Um, there could be a goal that's set through um, a class observation and if it has to do with one of the areas that we're focusing in PVC for the year, um, we encourage our teachers to go through that more intensive cycle of practice-based coaching to improve um, their teaching area practice. Okay, so um, have you all, do you all understand what we're saying when we talk about class, teapot, tippy toes? It's what we use to measure um, teacher-child interactions. So the way this pyramid came about has a lot to do with our history. When we had the leadership change, we had had a established behavior team. Now our behavior team for the program at the time helped staff to understand what universal practices were in place and how to implement those teaching practices that are outlined in class, tippy toes, and teapot. When the new leadership came on, um, the culture made a little shift as to not, uh, we had a huge new staff with adding programming, we added staff. So you had your senior staff from Lancaster County Head Start that were very knowledgeable about PBIS and universal practices and how to implement. We were implementing with fidelity um, that, and another thing that's a little different about us is we built in a lower targeted, whereas because we are serving the neediest of the needy children, um, we teach social emotional competencies as part as our everyday, really, that's me, I thought I silenced it, sorry. Um, so with the new influx of staff, what we found was they weren't understanding what universal practices were. Could you just, this in the hallway would be great. Um, sorry guys. I totally lost my train of thought, sorry. So the behavior team kind of got together and said, okay, so where are the gaps? We have the senior staff that have a really solid understanding of what universal practices are, and then we have our newer staff that has little to no understanding, and now we're bringing infants and toddlers into the mix. So that's kind of how we developed the bottom of the pyramid. So universal practice are not a choice. However, what are we gonna do that we teach those that don't know what universal practices are? 
what is our systematic approach to implementing those teaching practices we want to see. So um, I had been working at one of our centers that we took on with the mixed age group and just kind of took our teapot and tippy toe information and used NCPMI as a framework. Um, we were really all about trauma informed, coming back from COVID and knowing the kind of experiences that the youngest learners were having, how are we gonna support them and our teachers? So that's kind of how it came about. So um, we have coaches that are in the classrooms kind of looking at what is the highest priority, what is the need. We look to our implementation, the NCPMI, trauma-informed implementation checklist, sorry, that's a big one, um, for guidance on what practices are we looking for and then where are the gaps and holes. So what we use, it kind of goes exactly the opposite. So I am a teacher that has universal practices in place. The coaches are coming in, they're doing universal visits, but what if they're not? What we found was we were getting a lot of behaviors in the classrooms that did not have their universal practices solidly in place. So we're, that's how the bottom of the pyramid developed. So we use NCPMI as that framework and the resources to help support the teachers in knowing what to put in place. Um, and it goes to targeted. If there is a lack of buy-in or still not an understanding, we bring the supervisors in to help develop a plan for the teachers to be successful. Okay. I don't know. I thought you were clicking. Oh, okay. So, are there any questions to this? But from here, about um, <coughs> what we're doing. I mean, any questions? Yeah. Great question. So, Jen, before you talk, just to repeat her question, um, she's asking. Uh, yeah, she's asking about um, the frequency of the universal visits and how long it takes to go from having a non-compliant teacher to get into more of that compliance universal range. Is that your question? Yeah. Got it. And we're kind of in a merge right now, so we're also short in coaches along with all the other staff, but we have a caseload of four to five classrooms. If you are in the universal <coughs> level, we are coming to see you once, at least once or twice a month to um, support you and help you feel more confident and implement more research-based practices. When you are in the tertiary, that's individualized. So you get to targeted where maybe your, your coaching supports would change from the NCPMI as a framework to more individualized. So here's your daily schedule. What's one strategy are we gonna try and implement and how can we embed that across your day? If that makes sense, right? So now, if you have a tertiary child in the same room that you are kind of having uh, they're on a closer cycle. It really depends individually, but usually if the, what has been successful is one action step. So what that looks like when you are in a targeted or tertiary cycle is your coaches are in pretty much being a member of the classroom team. What I get to do that you don't get to do is stand back. And what are your transition strategies? What are your individualized strategies for these kiddos that need a little more support? We are debriefing every day and then one action step for the next day, right? Um, we have, I wanna say, 
three years going from now, the other benefit of the center that I was in is that you had seasoned staff mixed with new staff. So if we had a teacher that was really struggling, we had the opportunity to partner her with a more seasoned teacher that had a really deep understanding. And then the coach and the teacher, mentor teacher, to come work together to build those skills. Um, I've, we found a lot of success. Betsy was a teacher at one point, and uh, one of the teachers that was really struggling worked with her for a year, and the difference was just night and day. It's when everybody's kind of working in the same direction. So one action step. We're going to do this one thing, and typically that's when you get the buy-in, when they are successful with that one thing, and that the entire team understands what the goal is, and we're all moving in the same direction. Sorry about that. Just one thing to add to that. Um, like Jennifer said, it's very individualized. So what classroom A is doing isn't going to be what classroom B is doing. And we also recognize that sometimes people aren't doing what they need to be doing because they don't know that they need to be doing it. It falls back to, did we prepare them for the job that we're asking them to do? So that is also taking into account into this plan. Am I not doing it because I don't know it versus I know it and I'm choosing not to. So there are some different paths depending on the reason behind it. And like she said, it might start with the whole classroom team because we're not really sure what's going on here and where the disconnect is. And then the whole classroom might continue on a plan or we might be able to figure out, okay, it's this teacher here that needs a little bit more. And then they would be able to break off into their own action plan. So it is very individualized for the classroom, for the teachers, for everybody involved. And one of the things that I've done recently too is making sure that there's dates of the timeline on the action plan. Um, so not just like a list of things that need to be completed, but like action steps. So um, for example, like um, as a coach, I'm gonna email you the classroom labels that I don't see all up in your classroom yet. So if you could, I'll do that by this Friday and then in two weeks, I wanna see that they're back in the classroom and they're up and they're laminated on the shelves and on the bins. Um, just to provide a little bit of an example. Um, we like to make sure that we're giving concrete <laughs> deadlines too, as opposed to just an abstract, vague um, idea. Right. Yeah. And as we do that, this is where we're also working with a supervisor. So we're very intentional. Like if Betsy says, I'm gonna email you these visuals by this day, and then they need to be up by this day for us to come in, Betsy needs to do her job by this day in order for the team to even make it to their deadline. But then we have that time that you needed it up by this Friday, myself, your supervisor, somebody will be coming in to kind of check on that, right? Because if we say we're gonna do something and we don't, like people aren't gonna follow through. So we're very intentional about the timelines and that they're realistic. Like Betsy can't be like, I expect these up by eight o'clock tomorrow morning if our meeting's at three o'clock this afternoon. So we're very intentional about what are we asking? <laughs> how much time is that gonna take? Because we want people to be successful. That's the goal. We don't ever wanna go in and have them not make any progress. So how can we help them make that progress? Who can help them along the way? And if I could piggyback off that, it, um, sorry, I just lost my thought. Um, so, Goodness. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go. So again, we've already talked a lot about this, how the practices have to be in place. Again, health and safety goes out the window. When you're in the coach and something happens, I'm now taking off my coaching hat and we're dealing with this health and safety issue and we're running it up the chain as far as it needs to go. Um, but other than that, like we're not in there trying to find them and be like, ah, gotcha, you aren't doing this. Like we're in there to help support them. Um, so we really try to make sure that they understand that, but there are times when we might have to um, address something. And again, talking about, are they not doing it because they're missing it because we didn't teach it to them versus are they choosing not to do it? And this is again, that accountability piece with the supervisors. We are working very closely with those supervisors because ourselves, the supervisors and the teaching team all make up that team. So I need to make sure that what I'm saying, the supervisor going in is helping to support that and also looking for the same things. Just like if a supervisor goes in and tells them something they need to work on or something that's missing that I'm helping to support that supervisor. So we want everybody to be on the same page to help the classrooms 
meet their goals and objectives. Sorry, if I could just, I remember. <laughs> Sorry, I had a 60 year old moment. Um, but what is important for you all to know is that NCPMI and practice based coaching um, both have really good tools that you could use. So when Jen talked about those coaching goals, we go in and talk about coach and coachee agreement. So it is documented on there. By this date, I will do this. I will be back on this date. Now, what I'm finding with the infants, what I'm finding with the infants and toddlers are, um, because their understanding of universal practices is kind of in the really early stages, is that sometimes those goals are too lofty. So we're setting those goals based on teapot and tippy toe information, but then when we do our plan, what I'm finding is sometimes we have to back off of that. And the great thing about that is it's a working fluid document. Um, how are you feeling about how I'm supporting you? How am I feeling about our progress and um, completion of those goals? So, yep. So when um, target is, is needed for compliance, the supervisor, like Jen said, is really involved in this point. So the great thing about um, our framework now is that we are not the supervisors, so we are the coaches. However, um, working closely with the supervisors so there is some accountability in place um, because implementation is what changes outcomes. So even if it's just one step towards that, that's what we want to see. So the um, supervisor communicates with the coordinator about what needs to um, be in an action plan and why that is in the action plan. So um, the supervisor is responsible for holding staff accountable with the use of the compliance and the action plan. So again, we can step in and really support them when they get their plan. And the same for tertiary. So what's complicated about this and is included in this is when you thought about the old pyramid, we were talking about kiddos and their um, needs where tertiary is at the top. Some of our staff members kind of need that sort of support to help understand the why. Um, for instance, I'll just give you an example. We have a bucket filling system, which is um, we want to get very specific feedback on the behavior we want to see, and we want to do that five to every one correction. Many people see that as kind of like a system of bribery because they're not understanding and we're just kind of blowing smoke and being positive and not being real and not understanding the behavior. Um, so that may be something, everyone has a bucket filling system in the room, but not everyone understands the point behind it. What we want to hear is responsive language. What we want to hear is what we want to see versus no, don't stop. No, don't stop, again, safety first. That's necessary at points. But how do we implement that language which really, when you think about a two-year-old, it's very unnatural. I have 20 two-year-olds in a space. That's, that's not a natural occurrence. So what's my job? To monitor, to make sure everyone's safe. So what's coming out of my mouth? Oh, no, don't climb. Stop. That's not safe. Answer. Flip that to responsive could be, OK, we're going to go to the playground. So we're going to use our walking feet. We have one teacher that has implemented a song every time she goes to the playground. Um, we are walking in the hall to go to the playground. We are marching in the hall to go to the playground. So the kids, just kind of that transition strategy is very intentional and planned. 
Um, so also along with that, as we move down and move into those more tertiary pieces, the accountability really falls to the supervisor because as the coach, we can come up with the action plan. We can tell you what we need to do, how we're going to help support it, when it needs to be done by, but if you don't do it, we don't have any control over that. So we really need the supervisor's buy-in as well, and as they work down, the supervisor starts to take over. The coaches are still involved. We're still supporting that teacher. We're still supporting those children. We're still supporting that ELS if they need help, but they're the ones now driving this because the accountability piece for the teaching team isn't there. So there's our action plan. <coughs> Anything about it, we can skip on. No, that, that's just a kind of formalized version that now it's, it's a team, the coach is taking a step back, the supervisor is more um, directive in what this will look like and sound like and setting deadlines, yes. So, you know, we often talk about the need to have coaching be separate from supervision because coaching is supposed to be supportive and that's hard with the supervision. But what I think I'm hearing from you, and if I'm hearing it correctly, I really like it, is that <laughs> being coached or needing coaching or participating in coaching is pretty voluntary, is supportive, is all of that kind of thing. Failure to participate in the coaching that you are, I mean, to, to follow through on the coaching in which you are participating is where it becomes a supervisory issue. Well, if you think of, if this helps frame it, which makes perfect sense in my mind, we're not- to re re repeat the question. I'm oh, I'm sorry. The question was that is coaching a choice? It sounds like a choice, but if you, it's not a choice to participate in that coaching, um, which is correct. The compliance piece, I think, of more as a preventative. Okay, so if you are a new employee, I'm going to come into your room as a coach to help you understand universal practices. After so much time, or you just buy, don't buy in, or we don't do that here, um, is when the supervisor will step in. The what's what we're finding now is we're merging both academic and um, social emotional coaching together is that a lot of our supervisors are part of that new staff and need to develop a deeper understanding of what um, universal practices are and how to support, how they can support those practices. And just one other thing too, so as they're going down, is what supports can we give you to ensure you're meeting this compliance and the accountability piece? So again, it's still that support behind it, but it's not a choice when you're going down. But we still are trying to be supportive as much as possible. <laughs> no, just, yeah, sorry, <laughs> you had a question. That's my passion. <laughs> so um, what she's asking, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. So what she's asking is, are you, is the goal to build all knowledge on what solid universal practices are, supervisors, directors, to um, floating assistants, yes. So it is, um, kind of getting all of us moving in the same direction. So to help, that's kind of like where we're leaning next. How can we support the supervisors in understanding how they can support best practices for um, all staff? Yep, and along with that, that goes that relationship building piece. If you're new to the teaching team, if you're new to the supervisor, that trust isn't there yet. So it can be kind of hard to make sure like, 
Okay, they are here to help me. Okay, they are on the same lines with my supervisor. So really making everybody, it's very clear. We are on the same team. You know, if Betsy's a supervisor and she says something, I'm gonna support her and we might have conversations over here about what we might wanna change or do differently. But in front of the team, we're our united front and we're there to help them. Um, and then eventually, yes, the supervisors will be able to do more of this on their own and then we can keep going to the top to the practice-based coaching that teachers want because I'm doing this and I wanna keep escalating my knowledge and my ability to put it into my classroom practices. So I, I'm in compliance, um, we're also using practice-based coaching. It's more of the NCPM my practice based coaching and when you think of the top of the diamond it's more of my academic practices um, but how did we get those social emotional competencies embedded across our day um, so yeah so one of the things that uh, I think is really intentional is the relationship building which is what we've talked a lot about um, so far, but um, some of the tools that we use in our classrooms to assess our, our teachers and um, the environment really help guide those conversations. Um, so some of the things that we do use, I'm sure many of you are familiar with many of these, um, but the class tool, um, so we implement that from our infant classrooms all the way up into our school age classrooms, um, as well as the teapot tool, the teaching pyramid observation tool, and tippy toes, which is the same for infant and toddlers. And then um, <coughs> we have our creative curriculum, which we use, and our gold um, data from that, as well as our walkthroughs from our supervisors that include assessment monitoring and the different kinds of observations that our teachers are collecting um, as far as gold data goes. And then our visits from our classroom coaches um, to really provide that foundation and that ground level support for building those relationships and having those debriefing conversations together as a team. So sometimes on the coaches end, it does take a little bit more of that back of the house um, relationship building with the supervisor first. Um, that's at least what I found <laughs> this year especially, um, is really forming that relationship with the supervisor um, from the get-go and just kind of being present I think has been a big thing that we found is important as well. Um, historically, um, before our merge, our curriculum coaches were not as present in the classroom, so that's one of the things that I've grown in and my colleague Jen has grown in as well. Um, so now that we're kind of out and about and forming those relationships with the supervisors, it's more intentional and that bond kind of starts from the beginning. So before kids are even in the classrooms um, in the end of August or beginning of September, we're having those debriefings to kind of set the tone of the school year and going out and doing a walkthrough visit of the classroom. Oh, I love how you set up this, this area of the classroom. I love how you intentionally put the library next to the science area. They're two calmer areas of the classroom. And really using that foundations book from our curriculum um, to guide those conversations and how we set the tone for the school year. So all these preventative measures. So we try and hope that our classrooms don't end up in that compliance area, although we're not blind to the fact that sometimes um, teachers might not know as much or they might not be as bought in so it might take some more intentional debriefing and planning um, and these are just a list of some of the overall supports that we do provide um, our teaching teams and our teachers um, so we have our framework which is what we talked about today um, we have our universal practices for PBIS and then we also developed a list of what that looks like from the curriculum side as well um, so that's anywhere from the classroom environment to what the lesson planning pieces should look like um, to how assessment should be. So we really try to set our teachers up for as much success as possible from the beginning of the school year. Um, and one of the things we've been talking about intentionally lately is maybe doing a reset. Um, since COVID, it's been a little bit murky of like, oh, this is what my classroom is supposed to look like and this is how I'm supposed to write my lesson plan now as opposed to that virtual world where you're behind the camera and you're not your environment just looks a little bit different. Um, so we talked intentionally about maybe doing a reset next year and maybe even middle of this year, I don't know, about what things are supposed to look like. Because again, if our teachers don't know what that is, um, it's hard to hold them accountable for something they don't know, so. <coughs> Go ahead. And that's why, yeah, we try to have all these resources again. So if we're asking them to do us something, they have the resources they need to get it done. And we're not asking them to, you know, blindly work their, through their day when they have no idea, like, what is a red flag? What should my lesson plan look like? So setting them up for success from the get-go. 
Um, so just some of the takeaways, universal level, again, that's where most of our staff are gonna stay throughout the year. Um, when you do get to targeted, you can go down for the compliance or up for the quality. Again, we really want to move up in that quality because that's how we move the needle in best practices and help support our capacity building. But we also, again, we know there are expectations. They have to be in place. They're not optional. Um, and then again, that tertiary, again, it can be compliance or quality. And coaching, again, we're supporting the staff in quality and we're a resource for them for building their growth and even if they're struggling and need some compliance supports. We are there to help them wherever they are. Just like we help the children where they are, we're trying to do the same thing with our teaching teams and with our staff. Uh, I'm just, this was just kind of what we did. So we rolled it out. We've asked staff feedback, open doors, surveys, collaborative conversations. We got some feedback from our Head Start specialist and then continued to make some shifts in our coaching model to help better support our classrooms, right? Because we have to make sure what we think is working is really working for the people that we're providing it to. So we're very intentional about talking to the teachers, about talking to the supervisors, what's working, what's not, what can we do differently to help you and allow you to be successful. So any other questions? And if, if I could just add a little bit to the end of that. Um, it's really easy to get overwhelmed and caught up in what everything that's not correct versus flipping it and just focus. So what are my priorities? Are the big fives in place? Do we have nurturing, responsive language and relationships going on? Use those research-based tools. I open the foundation book often. What happened in our program and the, and the culture shift was that's a behavior, this is academic, when really our foundational pieces of curriculum are about both. Um, how do you set that classroom community and trusting relationships with the children and the staff? Um, in the classroom. All right, well, if you have, thank you for coming. Our contact information is up there. Um, we hope you got something out of this, something you can take away or rethink. Um, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Sorry, I get embarrassed.